Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Samantha Pantalapoulos. Oh, man, I fumbled that last name. Pantalopoulos. Hey, please help him pronounce it again. Pantazopoulos. It was good. Pantazopoulos. Oh, so close, folks. And we even talked about this name. It was like, I was like, oh, it's just the way it's, it's kind of written just the way it sounds. But still, I fumble all the time. Sam, how are we doing today? I'm doing been great. Don't worry about it. I've been working on it my entire life. So, I have plenty of experience. <laughs> so Sam is the CEO and co-founder of Viver. Uh, it's a premier retail marketing intelligence platform helping consumers brands dive online, uh, drive online shopping in source. So we're going to get into all of that information. But first, Sam, give us a little background. Who is Samantha? Great question. And such a big one. I <laughs> grew up in a small town in Maryland. And I was just kind of living life there. I never played sports as a kid. I always was into business, ironically, and only child. So I had a lot of time on my hands. Always getting into kind of like different projects, different things. My COO, who I work with today, lived across the street and we were constantly doing little projects together and dreaming up what businesses could look like one day in the future. But spent my time in Maryland until 17, just thinking about how do I get to California? That was like the central North Star that I always had a dream on my heart and ended up going to University of San Diego for college. So I moved out when I was 17 and never looked back. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's that's actually a pretty cool story that you and your chief operating officer have been neighbor. Like had what are the what are the things you guys were working on with kids? Like when you guys were younger, what were you guys doing? We were getting into all kinds of things. It, we met very randomly. His, his brother was riding a bike down the street and had flipped his bike and had to be rescued by my dad. So that's how our families kind of got connected. He's a few years older than me, so we may not have met in school or otherwise. But we had very similar mindsets of what was fun to us. And it was creating different projects and different visions and different dreams. And we did everything from a lawn care business that we ended up getting his younger brother to work in, to a podcast, to a rock band, to anything you could imagine. We were thinking like, how do we turn this into something and who would the customer be and how could we scale it? And very, very early on. That is so unique. I mean, there's so many, it's, it's kind of funny, folks. I think this is kind of life in general, right? Where you never know where life's going to lead you and who you're going to meet throughout life that's actually going to propel you forward. I think so often, especially in the entrepreneurship world, and this is, again, in the importance of networking, I think when you're an entrepreneur, is there are so many individuals out there that are willing to help you succeed, you know, that you just haven't met yet. So really just kind of take that time and now and go out there and meet folks. Now, now let's talk a bit about Vibra. What, what is it? Tell us a little bit about it. So really simply, what we're doing is we're helping consumer brands with discounts and promotions. So I like to say, if you went into a Walmart, a brand would work with Visor to do a discount on one of their products or services. So say it's a dollar off, say it's a free product. We help create these offers and then the brands distribute them and consumers can go in and claim them. So Visor is short for incentivize and we're basically powering that whole process for consumer brands. Oh, this is I, so folks, I think, you know, this is one thing we kind of talk about pretty consistently on the show is, is the, the sales funnel. And, and so folks, if you think about this, what essentially this is, this is a tool to help you re retain a loyal customer, essentially, right? Totally. Yeah, I would say we're on both sides of the fence. So retaining customers and also kind of growing new business. But it's great for the retention side, because say you have an email list, or you have a community of people that's interested in one product or interested in your brand, sending a, a offer, like a dollar off product, try our new SKU, try this at a discount is a great way to kind of expand in the category and get more spaces in their pantry or in their fridge. Oh, that's, you know what, let's take us through that process. Cause that's, that's a really good point. So for somebody listening at home that is getting into this and, and is thinking about creating some type of marketing funnel, right. To get individuals either aware or becoming loyal, where do they start? Like if I'm, if I'm thinking of marketing, where do I even start? Yeah, it's such a great question and such a broad one, because I think you have so many steps to the funnel. You have your kind of top of funnel brand awareness, which is who am I? What do we stand for? What's the creative we're putting out? And it's so much deeper than a logo or a brand, but kind of having that top of funnel awareness. 
But then how do you start moving people through that funnel? So what are your touch points going to be? What channels are you using? I think often people over diversify too quickly when really, if you are really consistent on one to two channels, that's a great way to get in front of a target audience and start to grow that relationship. And the relationship piece becomes really key because customer feedback, user-generated content, all of these things can start supporting your content ecosystem to move people even deeper through the funnel, say you're only in one channel, ultimately driving people to that point of purchase, which is how do we get them over the line and how do we get them to buy the product? That's where middle funnel, lower funnel, those discounts, incentives, promotions become really powerful. How does how does marketing, you know, you're kind of talking about, you know, capturing consumers, right? The consumer acquisition costs. How does marketing help actually lower the cost of a consumer acquisition in retaining those consumers? Yeah, I think marketing can be one of your biggest sales tools at the end of the day, especially if you're strategic about how you are structuring your funnel. So many times people are just pouring money into experimental channels or pouring money into paid, even after it's kind of lost its stickiness or its relevancy. So figuring out like what are the evergreen tools and channels and programming I can use that's low cost, but high return and start pushing that out in a variety of ways. You kind of find like, this is the thread. This went through the needle. Okay, now I want to start putting this on multiple channels rather than doing that upfront and having the investment with every channel that you start to play with. Smart. That is actually really smart. And one of the things you just, one word you just said that I think is really interesting is, is relevancy. Why is, you know, when you think about marketing and you think about branding publications and things about, you know, sparking someone's interest, why is relevancy so important in marketing? I think a lot of times people think about their sales and their marketing and their promotions from a very brand centric perspective what they think is cool, what they think is timely, what they think is relevant. And that's great for creative idea formation, but it has to be relevant to the consumer at the end of the day for that campaign to perform well, which is why you see so many big creative campaigns just fall flat. So understanding like who is your customer? What are they looking for? What's their language that they're speaking in? How do you make sure your messaging is resonant for your audience? Is kind of step one. And then you can back up and say, okay, now what are the creative things that we can infuse with what we know about the brand internally? I think it happens in the opposite order frequently. And then that creates a bit of like a lack of relevancy for the customer. You know, that, that's a, that's a very good point. And I work in the healthcare industry folks, you know, and so I've been talking about that business development. And so when, when you're kind of thinking about target audiences, so for example, if I'm trying to grow my advanced heart failure the service line, my target audience is cardiologists. Now, cardiologists are probably going to be more interested in devices and how the devices work, that kind of information, right? And so my marketing to them is going to be more talking about outcomes, what we use these devices for, what the outcomes we receive. Now, all providers are going to generally want that, right? Now, the thing about it is, again, the pro providers are my primarily target audience. Now, when I switch on my oncology hack for cancer outreach, my now my the patients are my primary target audience. And so my marketing begins to change. I'm no longer talking about devices and outcomes, although I will with the referring provider, but for a patient, I'm not, I'm not talking about patient stories, right? Talking about how we're going to care for the patient, how we're going to bring in their family member into this patient care, how we're bringing in the community provider, because again, the messages, uh, the message is a little different because the end goal is a little different as well. Uh, to you know, Samantha's point, relevancy is important. And so with the cardiologist, devices are relevant, right? They, they, they work with those, they see them in clinics, they understand it. And then for the patient, relevancy is their family, their well-being, right? How they, they want to feel cared for and about. And so understanding those two, those segments is important. And I really like what Samantha was saying is understanding who your customer is, like what is your ideal customer profile is so important because the last thing you want to do is go put a billboard in front of a, a basketball stadium talking about like McDonald's or something like when that's actually a good opportunity, maybe talk about like sports rehab, right? Cause you know, product, you know, placement is also important and understanding who, who your uh, customer is and where they go to is, is very important. Where do they tend to shop? Where do they tend to visit? Cause then you can kind of put, you know, marketing things in that nature. Now, Samantha, let's, let's take a step back a little bit. You mentioned, you know, you, you started this uh, marketing, you, you actually started with your neighbor, who's your CEO. 
why marketing? How did you, how did you get into marketing? Where did that all start? So it's a very roundabout story, in fact. And I always like to say what you start with usually isn't what you end with in the entrepreneurship game. <laughs> I'm that sure you've seen that <laughs> across all of your episodes. But I was a college student and studying abroad on semester at sea. I was participating in a social venture incubator, actually. And it had this whole kind of thesis around a competition. How can you use business to spark social change? And ideally with an issue that is personally passionate or you're personally passionate about. And, and I hated working out. So I had the idea for an app where every day you work out, you had the opportunity to donate meals through US food banks, and then you could earn healthy rewards for yourself. I actually launched it with my cousin, who's my co-founder, and then Nick joined a year or so later, something about wanting to get a job that paid you. We didn't understand at the time, but <laughs> he joined a year or so later. And that was kind of how we got started. So we were building this consumer app that had a rewards ecosystem to it. We started with restaurants actually, but restaurants all shut down during COVID. And yeah. that's how we ended up pivoting to retail. And we realized that the technology that we had built for this retail rewards program was actually much more powerful outside of the confines of our app because we could reach a lot more people than if it was kind of gate kept behind an app download. and. The company evolved really organically through customer conversations and just trying to figure out like what is the path forward. But I certainly did not know we would arrive here when we started, as I think most ideas kind of unfold. You know, I like your kind of trajectory into the business because one of the things you kind of talked about was getting the customer feedback. Why was that so important for determining how you're going to essentially establish this the new venture that you created? I think customer feedback is everything at the end of the day. The intention of the competition I did, finding something that's personally relevant for you, I think is important because that gives you kind of the determination and the conviction to stick with the idea when it's really challenging. But I also heard somewhere, your first idea is typically very self-interested. Going back to what we were saying about marketing campaigns, what do I think is cool? What do I think is relevant? And it's not really until the customer is playing with it and consumers are playing with it that you realize what's missing and what it needs. So we were very active from the first day of starting the company and constantly talking to people and socializing the idea and figuring out what's working about this and what isn't. And it was through a thousand conversations and people kind of nudging us in different directions that we ended up where we have. And I think there's two pieces to that, like collecting all of that feedback, but then how do you synthesize it with your own framework and figure out what you think is the best path forward. But customer conversations were everything for us. And we still actively to this day, every single day are talking to customers about how is this working for you? What else would be interesting? How can we support with other problems that you have? And where's the overlap? It's, it's a very ongoing conversation. And you know what's interesting about the two is they're they're kind of synonymous. Like you kind of need them to work together. Uh, let me give you an example. My first business, Eslam Apparel, completely crash and burn. I knew what the customers wanted, right? Essentially, my goal was to create a new T-shirt, uh, really kind of re-image the, the standardization of sizes. So I'm a kind of taller, lengthy guy. And I hated like purchasing like certain brand shirts, like an extra large, and they fit me like a sleeping bag. But as soon as I washed them, right, they became like a tube top. And so I was really trying to recreate how that looked. And so I wanted a slimmer, lengthier shirt that didn't really shrink. But the only problem was I didn't know how to market. I didn't, I didn't know about SEO. I, I created a website, didn't do any blogs. Facebook was just kind of coming out at that time. There was no TikTok. There was no Instagram. There was no social media push. So the only thing I was doing was like, you know, going out to different fairs and, and selling them out there. I knew people wanted what I was creating, right, from the size perspective. And it became evident when Untucked came out and pretty much had the same idea, much better marketing than I did. <laughs> But it's 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 imperative that you know these two are synonymous with each other. One understanding you know who who you're who you're marketing to and what they want, and then actually how to market to them. Because I'll tell you that, folks, that was where my first company completely crashed and burned. Because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't know how to market like at all. <laughs> it was just something I did not know how to do. And I think it, it's so tough, right? Because you find something that you're personally passionate about and you want to bring it to life and you have to be open enough to say, oh, the customer feedback isn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. 
okay, how do I integrate what these people are saying? And you kind of have to check your own ego. And I certainly had to do that several, several times. And it's a tough spot to be in. But I think if you can do it and kind of move forward and continue making progress, you'll get all these nudges and signs telling you what to do. You don't need to go in with the complete roadmap. And if you do, it will probably go completely differently. So I always tell people to start, talk to people, see what they say, and then take a step at a time. You know, that's a, that's a very good point because I think a lot of times as entrepreneurs, it, it, you're mentioning it, you know, we, we kind of send a, tend to create like an entrepreneurial endeavor based off of personal needs or, or wants, right? Trying to create or trying to solve a problem that we're facing ourselves individually. Um, but then sometimes not everybody has that problem, right? It, it becomes like, oh, I'm, I'm basically have a solution for a problem that nobody has. I don't have a market for it. And so when you receive criticism or, or feedback, I'm not saying criticism, but feedback from your consumers, don't take it um, personal. They're not attacking you. Uh, they're trying to help you fix your problem. Because again, at the end of the day, if if a consumer is willing to reach back in their pocket, pull out their wallet and pay you for something, uh, it, it behooves you to probably kind of listen to some of the, what they have to say, because they're the ones, they're the end consumer. They're the ones actually purchasing that item from you. And it's also a good opportunity for you to learn. I mean, fail fast. Uh, failure is the best education you can get. It's it's free. You know, you can go pay, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars for a master's degree, or you can go try a bunch of things for a couple hundred dollars fell and learn a bunch. Like I started learning about marketing and SEO because my clothing line business fell, right? I started this podcast during the pandemic because I was paying the hundred thousand dollars to read a bunch of textbooks online because of the pandemic, right? So it's like, I'm paying a master's degree to basically read entrepreneurial success stories. Why don't I just start a podcast and do it for free? Right. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of things you can kind of learn um, through failure, uh, but also just getting out there asking consumers what they want, what they don't like, and then, you know, continue to test your thesis. Once you find that minimal vile product that people are willing to purchase. Okay. Now you can scale it. Okay. Now you can put in a little bit more money, right? If you want to, you know, purchase a, a large, a large, you know, whatever items of supplies or something to continue to move it forward. Okay. Now at least you have a general idea that this product or service in fact does sell and people are interested in it because the last thing uh, entrepreneurs should be doing is, you know, thinking of an idea and then going balls to the wall, putting in $10,000 into it and just completely burning because they're not a market. So get out there and just make sure, you know, you, you meet with people and, and talk with people. Now, now, Sam, you kind of mentioned, uh, pretty early on you, that you were like, you know what, I'm going to start this kind of venture and kind of see where it's going. Although it has, it has different iterations and it has a new iteration now, but what made you start your entrepreneurial journey in the first place? You know, that's the big question. <laughs> I, I just had some, <laughs> some choices before me. It was, I was about to graduate. Am I going to get a job or am I going to pursue this project? And as I was interviewing for jobs and meeting with different opportunities, somebody told me, I, I remember, I think it was somebody at Salesforce, but they were like, if you want to be innovative, a big company at your stage probably isn't the place to do it. You should go to a startup. And I started talking to different startups and the feedback I got was, well, if you have an idea for a startup, why aren't you doing that? So it was these people just kind of nudging again. Why aren't you looking at this? You're talking about it. You're really passionate. Sounds like something you would have the skill set for potentially. Don't you want to explore that? And I think I just looked at you know the timeline of my life and I thought, okay, my 20s is a time to really mess around and figure things out. And I don't have a family. I don't have a mortgage. When am I going to have this freedom again to pursue something like this? And if it doesn't work, I can always go get a job was kind of my mindset. But I think there was also an inkling in me that was it will work. So go do it. I think if I didn't have that confidence, I probably would have ended up at a big tech job. You know, I, it's it's kind of interesting you you say that. It's like we were talking about it when we first started this uh, conversation of the kind of the entrepreneurial ecosystem of individuals willing to help you to propel you forward because they want to see you succeed, right? It's really interesting in the the small business kind of startup world where you'll go to a networking event and somebody will say, oh, you, you're you starting up a thing. We have operations. Oh, I got like 20 people you can talk to about operational issues. Here's your contact information. It's almost like you become overwhelmed 
with information uh, of, of contacts because people are so willing to help you. Now with you, how important was networking and growing your business? It was huge. And San Diego is such an incredible innovation ecosystem. And it was really evolving in that time. So we had, we started full time on this in 2018. And San Diego has evolved tremendously just in that time period. But everybody was so helpful. I think being really young was a huge gift as well. I would email people for years after I graduated, recent college graduate reaching out, dot, dot, dot. And people were just so generous with their time. And there were a lot of accelerator programs that we participated in. And my co-founder Dylan and I were also cousins. We're very intentional. If we're going to do a program, then we're going to go to lunch with these people. We're going to reach out and we're going to get coffee. We want to have a deeper conversation than just that 10 minute nice to meet you. This is what you're working on. And in the first year we met with like 400, 500 people just saying, wow. this is what we're doing. Do you have any feedback, any ideas, any suggestions, anybody else we should talk to. And it created this tree of people who ended up being instrumental to the next step of our journey. And I don't think any of those things would have happened had the door not been opened for a conversation and that person been generous enough to give their time. Yeah, you know, a general, it's, it's interesting because I think, uh, you know, people always say um, they, they definitely want donations, right? Funding is, is, is gold, but volunteer time is, is like platinum, to be honest with you folks. Uh, if you're able to get into somebody's room for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, who is an executive of a startup or who has done this before, who has gone through many exits and, and gone through, you know, funding rounds, that, that opportunity is just immense. I, I can't even begin to explain it. Now, Samantha, you mentioned you've actually gone through, if I recall correctly, you mentioned an incubator and now you mentioned accelerator. Tell me of your experience of going through those programs and what did you see was beneficial, but as, as you, you know, being coming a, an aspiring entrepreneur. Huge to be involved in some kind of program. That's the right fit. I think there were several pro programs that were in front of us. And we ended up doing a select few that were aligned with our vision of entrepreneurship, the kind of company that we wanted to build with the economics of what we thought was reasonable. So I always try to give that caveat because I do think there are a lot of accelerator programs and incubator programs where the economics don't make sense. The ROI is not there. And I encourage founders away from those kinds of programs. But the ones we did were very community-based. We ended up doing, the first one we did was an all women's accelerator run by one of our now investors, Dr. Sylvia Ma, which was fabulous. And Dylan, my cousin and co-founder is a, a man, but he was in it as well, which was great. And then we ended up doing an accelerator program probably a year or so after that, which was a competition that had a million dollar cash prize oh, associated wow. with it. And we tied for winning that prize. So we won $500,000, which became effectively our pre-seed round. And absent these two experiences, I don't think Pfizer exists today. So having that foundation and in the first one learning, how do you build a pitch? Like we'd done a bit of that in the program that I did in college, but how do you communicate your idea? Learning how to do these informational interviews and how to sit down with somebody and how to ask for help in a way that it'll be received. I mean, to your point, meeting with executives, I would email anybody, quite literally anybody. And 90% of them would respond and say, yeah, I'd love to have you come in. Let's coordinate a half hour, an hour. They'd go to lunch, they'd go to coffee. So like just asking, I think was what was really taught in the first program that we did. And that was key for everything that we did thereafter. Yeah, I, I agree. In fact, you know, folks, I'm sure, you know, people listening are, are very aware because I've probably talked about this probably way too often. Uh, we created a nonprofit Latino founders. It's a business accelerator pitch competition here in Oregon, very community based. Uh, our pitch competition is actually done in the community and the actual audience votes live on the winner right then and there. And the beauty of it is we actually give out grant funding. So similar to you, uh, we we do have to give out an award. So last year we gave about $40,000 in grant funding to entrepreneurs. Our goal is to help scale 100 Latino businesses here 
here in the Pacific Northwest to a million dollar reoccurring revenue in five years. And we're doing it through our accelerator and pitch competition. We currently have 32 individuals in our business accelerator program. We talk about, you know, value proposition, business canvas, minimal vial product, really kind of getting folks uh, ready to scale the business. And then the grant funding, you know, like Samantha, you mentioned the, the award there's a lot of, you know, folks, when you're thinking about raising funds, there's a lot of different opportunities out there that you should explore outside of the venture fund. If you want to go venture route, by all means, you should, certainly. Um, the Small Business Association, the SBA, they have some good loans. Banks have good loans. Uh, but if you're looking for non-loan uh, like not like funds that you don't have to pay back grant funding is a good way to find that. And you can find that through a lot of these business accelerator and, and incubator programs. Uh, and, you know, to Samantha's point, make sure you find one that really suits your needs. Our business accelerator program is business agnostic. And we made it that way because I was reading on the Harvard Business Review of the importance of kind of creating this business agnostic steering the accelerator so it doesn't create a competition. Uh, a lot of times if you're like, you know, tech heavy, um, you know, you have your intellectual property and so you don't want to, you know, indulge too much information about what you're doing. Well, then that doesn't really allow us to help you as much because you might, you, there might be some problems that um, aren't unearthed because you're unwilling to kind of share. And so we really try to make our business accelerator business agnostic, really let, you know, people share their ideas of what's going, what's working, what's not working, right? Um, to, to, you know, what we've been talking about, just kind of networking, uh, experiencing, understanding, like, let's get the consumer in front of your product right now. We'll let them tell you right now if it's good or not good, and then take it to heart and we'll continue to, we'll continue to adjust. Um, and then mentorship, right? Continue to build that, continue to build with them. Continue to just like, you know, keep a, keep a connection with them. Now, for you've been doing this for some time. You've, you mentioned you've, you've gone through accelerators, you've gone through incubators, you've gone through iterations of your actual organization. What would you say has been the most rewarding piece for you as an entrepreneur? I would say the most rewarding piece has been building the team. We have 17 people now. We do all of our engineering in-house. Most of our team's based in San Diego, but we have a few folks that have moved around the country. Everybody's U.S. based. And Including the Portland, Oregon folks. We got, we got one of the employees up here in Portland. Exactly. Need to make a trip up. But that has been the, the continuity. So although our product has evolved over time, and although the market that we've served has evolved a bit over time, We've been building this team since the beginning. So I like to say that the product is probably 10% of the business. At the end of the day, the business is who's working there. What are the structures of communication between them? What are the processes in place? What are the values? What does the day-to-day -day look like? What are your systems? Like All of that is what enables the product at the end of the day. And we've been really intentional about finding incredible people and and working really closely and collaboratively and figuring out how do we like maintain the health of the organization over time. That's first and foremost for us. And if we have that, I think everything else will flow really naturally. So I've really, really enjoyed building the team and kind of nurturing that organizational health. I'm very internal. My co-founder is very external. So we're a really great balance in that way. And it's been a ton of fun for me. I like that yin and yang, you know, between you and your co-founder. And and that's a, you know, individuals, folks listening, leaders that are listening, there is no bigger equity in your organization than your people. You there, you can go buy a you can go buy a machine, you can go buy anything you want to buy, but there's nothing that's gonna be more equitable for your organization and the people you hire. And make sure you get the right people on the bus, right? Making sure you really have engaged employees that believe in your mission, that believe in your mission statement, that believe in your value proposition, and they're going to help you propel them forward. But it's also imperative as you as a leader that you are making sure if you're going to ask them to do something that you're willing to do it yourselves. I think that's why the startup world is, is so unique because entrepreneurs... When they when you start your first when you start your business you're the jack of all trade master of none I mean you are the operations lead you're the marketing lead you're the sales lead you're the IT tech you're human resources you're everything in one right and so the beauty of it is you get experience in all of those kind of you know divisions essentially within the organization and then so when you begin to start to you know parse that stuff out and have somebody else work it you know what should be good and what should not be good like as a leader though it's also important to make sure your operations are sound so your employees can succeed in what they do you know at the end of the day your employees are going to be your biggest assets but the operations the way you have your operations plan and everything set up 
that's going to help them succeed and really be enjoying their work and what they're doing. You know, you don't, you don't want a cave employee, someone that's comes in, they're constantly against virtually everything because that will just erode your culture at your organization. So just remember that treat your employees with respect and dignity. Those are the individuals, uh, individuals that are, are truly your biggest asset. Now, Samantha, we, we talked about some of the easiest things. What would you say have been some of the challenges of your growth through the entrepreneur endeavor that you've been doing? Which of the thousand would you like? I feel like <laughs> there's a, entrepreneurship is a up and down journey for sure. And figuring out, I think how, how to build the muscle of resiliency is a really difficult and painful thing to do at the end, end of the day. On the back end, resiliency is a great trait to have, but to navigate the experience of getting knocked down and getting back up and continuously having to do that. I think entrepreneurship, similar to maybe professional sports, it's like a very, or acting, it's a rare cohort of careers where you're continuously putting yourself out there and you're continuously being told no. And just figuring out like, how do you get your mindset in a place to be able to do that and to build the resiliency? I think that's really, really challenging, but it's preparing you to be able to do it in mass because the opportunities get bigger, the challenges get bigger. You get punched, it is harder. <laughs> so you have to get back up with more strength. So I think that's probably been the biggest challenge, but a very rewarding one at the end of the day. Very good point. And like I tell people, I think our, our character is judged by the way we deal with adversity, right? If, if you go through an adverse moment and uh, you're yelling and pouting and upset, people remember that, right? And that's kind of how they remember you. But if you're able to kind of take those adverse moments and, and deal with them in a calm, meaningful way and actually try to, you know, look through the smoke and mirrors and actually figure out what the problem is and, and move forward. That's really what makes not only individuals successful in entrepreneurial endeavors, but in their own personal life as well. Um, you know, I told my you know, folks, I'll be completely honest. I talked to my counselor. I got a meeting with him 3 30 this afternoon. And I was telling him the other day, I was like, you know, I love worrying because all the things I worry about never happen. So worrying is the best cure to any problem you ever have. Just worry about it because it seems it never happened. And, but one of those things I'm trying to work through is, not try to worry so much because there's so many cool things happening out there in life and it's easy to get bogged down on a lot of the things that are occurring but the beauty is that there's innovation happening every day and there's nobody started at the finish line you know all these great companies that have been have been started have been started in various settings have been started with sometimes with very little money and you can do it too. The The only difference between you and them is, is they actually went out and started doing it. You know, these people that actually go out, if you have an idea, like Samantha was mentioning, try it, go out, talk to people, see if it makes sense. Um, go out. And if you're, if you, if you figure out the idea does make sense, okay, go through an accelerator or incubator, right? Get up with some more like-minded peoples and really start to dive into it and see if it makes sense before you go and invest your own money. Once you feel like, okay, I'm ready to do it. By all means, rip the bandaid off. Um, but just know that there, there are, like Samantha mentioned, there are some ups and downs. There are going to be some challenging moments, but just continue to persevere and understand there is a, a community of entrepreneurs that are wanting to help you succeed in your community. So just go out, just reach out. There's a lot of people out there. They're willing to help you. You just got to ask. Now, Samantha, you've, you've been doing this some time. You've probably received a lot of great advice from a lot of individuals. What advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs? The piece that you were talking about, about the worrying, I think that's something really cool to unpack because worry is par for the course with entrepreneurship. There's always something to worry about, something breaking or capital running out or team issues or XYZ. There is a whole, whole list. All and the time. <laughs> I don't remember who told me this, but somebody told me, and I now preach it, like preach it to my organization, which is don't fight invisible enemies. Ooh, like it's one. so easy to invent a story and then our brain will believe the story. And then all of our behaviors from that point on are directed by this story, whether it's true or not. And that I'm like, it takes so much energy to invent this story of how this is going to go terribly and then prep for this terrible situation. And you get on the call and it's perfectly fine. Like what you thought was a massive issue was maybe a slight inconvenience to someone. So I'm constantly talking about this because it's so, so easy to do. Like, how do we pull ourselves back? And then if we get on the call and we're confronted, oh, this is a massive issue. It's not a slight inconvenience. At least you can collect all the information 
to then go worry about what you're going to do with like the facts. So somebody told me that I, because I am also a big worrier. So they told me that, and I think it every day on repeat, is this an invisible enemy? Probably. Okay, let's move on. Man, that that's a good point. I always tell people, you know, fight the problem, not the people. Uh, I think sometimes we get into heated conversations where we might not see eye to eye on certain things and we tend to attack the individual versus attacking the problem. Uh, you know, just focus on what you're what you're really what you're really trying to accomplish. Now, Samantha, what so let's what's 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 the goal, Visor? What's the next five year plan? Where are we gonna see Samantha in the next five five years or so? I wanna say it's Carta, the founder of Carta, who has a slogan I really like, but it's let's make this as big as possible so we can do as much good as we can. And that's really our goal, which is how do we be really, really performant? How do we build a tool that's really of service? How do we grow resources? And then how do we use those resources to redeploy them in a way that's meaningful for the things that we value? So for us, we're just trying to be laser focused. How do we build this company as big as we can? And then how do we use that to be of service? That man, you just dropping some quotes today. I'm like, I'm gonna have to write that one down too. Oh man, that is great. And I, 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 it's, it's, it's true. You know, growing, just growing as big as we can to so make as much impact as possible. I think is really important because, again, folks, if you're starting out a business, you know, making sure you have a good value proposition, um, so that becomes your true north. So when you have, like Samantha mentioned, you have up and down days. You're gonna have. You know, it usually starts first thing in the morning. You can't find your keys. You spilled coffee on yourself. You're late to work, right? Whatever it is. But just remember, like, look at that value proposition. That is your true north. That's going to remind you, like, why you wake up every day, why you're sitting in your basement late at night by yourself, pounding away at emails, you know, looking over at financial reports, talking about operational issues. It's because that right there, it's it's that value proposition, why you created this organization, or why you created this service, or why you created this product. That goal is why you do it every day. Right. And if you don't have a passion for that, I will be honest with you, folks. Sometimes it is difficult to be an entrepreneur if you don't have passion for what you're doing. It's sometimes being difficult just being an employee if you don't have passion for what you're doing. Right. So making sure you have passion for what you're doing. And, and if you if you're unsure what that passion is, get outside and experience life, talk to people, do different things, you know, go parachuting, go kayaking, go hiking, go find some inspiration. And if you find things that you all have seen love, like, wow, that's something to do. Like Starbucks. Starbucks is a great example. I mean, Howard Schwartz took a trip to Milan, Italy. And from that trip, he's like, I really want these coffee shops in, in throughout the America. Now I can't walk through Portland, Oregon without seeing a coffee shop every hundred yards. Truthfully, cannot. I just had a lavender latte the other day. I didn't know I was supposed to have a lavender latte and it was phenomenal. It was the greatest tasting thing I've ever had. Never knew I needed it in my life. So it's just understanding, you know, getting out travel and getting different experiences will actually create innovation. Now, Samantha, for the folks that are interested that want to learn more about you, maybe want to connect with you, how do they find you on the internet? How do they, where do they contact you? LinkedIn is probably the best place. Pretty active on there. It's just my name, Sam Panazopoulos. Our website for the company is joinvisor.com. We'd love to connect to anyone there. And if we're in the Oregon area, maybe we can get a lavender latte when I'm in town uh, visiting one of our team members. Yes, you let me know. I will gladly take you over there. I, it's this new coffee shop I just saw all downtown Portland. It was remarkable. I got to tell you, folks. And again, he makes it in-house, so it's like all freshly done. So it, it was awesome. Now, folks, if you forget any of the contact information that Sam just left you, please subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com. We'll go ahead and have this information the week before the episode airs, the week this episode airs, and the week after. There will also be a dedicated webpage with the transcription of this conversation and the audio version of the recording. Recording, and there'll also be a video and a dedicated blog post talking about some of the highlights of this conversation. Sam, I really do appreciate you taking the time. Is there any last words you have for our listeners? No, thank you so much for having me. I think my, my last words would be stop doubting and just go for it. Life's really short. And I think you said this earlier, but it's everyone's first time living life. Nobody you're looking at has anything more special than you do. So just start, figure it out along the way and have fun. Just start. Nobody has anything more special than you do. I, I completely agree. And folks, it's uh, everybody's first iteration is going to be weird. If you go look back at my first podcast episodes, they're not as good as these ones. Uh, but you do get better over time. And and just you know have fun with it. You know, uh, experience uh, like we're 
like when we were kids, uh, you do fall down and get some scratches sometimes. But uh, at the same time, I encourage everybody to color outside the lines because at the end of the day, it is your imperfections that make us perfect. So Samantha, thank you again so much for joining the show. For those interested, please follow me on the social sites, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at the Shades of E. You can also visit us at theshadesofe.com. Thank you and have a great night.